Welcome. I'm your host, Tana Zaberi, and welcome back to another episode of Justice for All Now. Thank you for joining us on Muslim Network TV, America's only Muslim-focused TV show. You can always watch us 24-7 on Roku TV, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, and various social media channels. Now, today we're going to be discussing um, as most of you know, Burma Task Force is one of our lead campaigns, the Rohingya campaign we've been working on uh, as an organization for several, several years. And updates from the camps, action alerts about what is happening on the camps is a daily part of our routine work. Um, today we have someone with us who's been a part of this work with us since the very beginning. Um, he ha he is a human rights activist, um, Shafi or Rahman, based in the United Kingdom. He's an award-winning documentarian. His interest in human rights, labor rights, trafficking, and the environment have, uh, you know, his work has been shown all around the world in the in the U.S., in Europe, Africa, Asia, and then. In the past, specifically in the last four years, he's been working on Rohingya-related journalism and really bringing to light things as they're happening from the camps. Um, and to, I mean, his we are indebted to his advocacy and his journalism. Thank you for joining us today, Brother Shafi Rahman. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me. It's a pleasure to, to talk with you. Alhamdulillah. I wanted to show our audience the latest clip that you've been sharing online from the camps. Uh, this is a fire that is occurring as, um, and uh, I hope uh, our producers can bring the video up now. <laughs> I do not know. Um, Brother Shafi, can you tell us where these images are from, which camps, and what is the status right now? Uh, these images that you've just seen uh, are taken from uh, a camp in the south southeastern tip of Bangladesh called Noyapara. Uh, it is Camp 26, and uh, overnight, 550 houses were destroyed, uh, many shops. Uh, people have absolutely they, they woke up to you know to all their possessions destroyed. Um, and this was just uh, three days ago. And um, during COVID, and this is a very old camp. This is not one of the newer uh, Cox's Bazar, uh, Katapalong camps. Could you tell us more about the, the Rohingya that are living in these specific camps? Yes, whether these are old camps or new camps, it really doesn't matter. Last year, there were two horrendous fires, one in April of last year and the other uh, a few weeks later in May of last year. Um, those were in relatively new camps. So it's, uh, it's really about how the camps are constructed, uh, how congested they are. And uh, really, I mean, the, the camps are constructed with uh, tarpaulin, which are not fire uh, retardant. Mm. They're constructed with plastic. They're constructed with bamboo. Uh, so it's um, it, it's it's just ripe for disasters like this. 
and there have been many such fires. Thankfully, the injuries in this fire um, that people sustained were minor. Uh, but last year, um, Rohingya were not so lucky. Uh, some children died and some people were horribly burned. Uh, but yes, as you say, this is a very old camp. This is, uh, this is away from the other camps in Ukia. This is right down in the tip of Bangladesh mm -hmm. uh, in Teknaf. And it contains this particular camp contained uh, UNHCR registered refugees, refugees who had come to uh, Bangladesh from Myanmar in 1992 and afterwards. So they've been there since 1992, well over now 20 years. And um, so this is something that I wanted to explain to, uh, for you to explain to our audience, for some of them, many people think that the, this uh, exodus just happened in 2017 and the history of, um, and I would like to get your take on that, the history of the waves of Rohingya have been coming into Bangladesh for the, over 20 years. Yes, no, I mean, the big happening was, of course, 2017, and that's, that filled everyone's screens, all the newspapers covered it and so on. But that is not uh, um, the case. I mean, the, really, this uh, this the, the persecution of Rohingya goes back decades, and people have uh, arrived in Bangladesh uh, from uh, 1978 since the 70s onwards, and particularly with a huge exodus in 1978. But we've seen since then that these are repeated. They're cyclical. They're like um, you, you know. The, the, uh, what happens is there's horrendous and catastrophic violence that takes place in Myanmar. People then come to Bangladesh, then they're forced back to Myanmar. Mm -hmm. Then there's again another round of persecution, another round of violence, which then propels people to come to Bangladesh and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and it is not sustainable repatriation because, of course, Rohingya do not have rights there. Mm. And that's the crux of the matter. Without rights, no matter how many times Bangladesh sends them back, the result will be the same. There will be persecution. They are without rights, and therefore they are extremely vulnerable. And history has shown that this is what happens to them repeatedly. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the sad history is that it uh, goes back decades uh, and we can trace the, uh, these camps back to 1978. Wow, this is, and this is something that, you know, considering the background of Bangladesh itself being a country crippled by many, many challenges itself uh, with a large population, what, um, how have you, it, like, and, and recently we hear of um, some of the population obviously getting, uh, uh, tired of hosting uh, um, this large amount of people. But can you comment on the historical aspect of how uh, welcoming a Bangladesh husband to the, the, the refugees, how, uh, uh, how, how have attitudes changed over the years and wh what, what, what should we expect in the future? Well, let me start with my own experience when in uh, 2016 and particularly in 2017 when tens of thousands of people were coming across the border i was at the border and i was seeing all these refugees pouring into bangladesh and the response that the bangladeshi villagers in the border areas um, uh, the way they responded to these refugees was really, I mean, very, very an emotional sight to behold. They would organize long queues uh, of people handing out little polythene packets of food. They would trips out into the mud uh, to help refugees come into Bangladesh. They'd give them a helping hand because it was incredibly muddy terrain, incredibly difficult to walk across. I had gumboots, I had, you know, um, uh, I'm, I haven't traveled for weeks and weeks, uh, or I haven't been injured, and, 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 and I found it difficult. So, mm. you know, it, it was incredibly uh, problematic terrain, and people rushed out. Um, 
to welcome these people in. They sheltered them in their own homes. Um, it was really, I mean, it was a, it was a tremendous uh, um, humanitarian spirit uh, that uh, took hold in, uh, of, of people down uh, in uh, Ukia and Teknaf, in those uh, areas where the refugees were pouring in. And people were very welcoming. Now, there's always existed a narrative in Bangladesh um, that, you know, Rohingya, um, sure, they're persecuted, sure, they're, they're Muslims, uh, just like the Bangladeshis are, sure, there's a connection, there's a linguistic connection as well. But there's always that kind of... Um, uh, kind of feeling towards the foreigner, uh, towards the, uh, you know, these these people who are called uh, infiltrators. Mm. They're not called refugees. Um, that, you know, they are problematic in that they are possibly drug smugglers, uh, that they're going to, um, you know, destroy the environment, um, resulting... Uh, in uh, crimes uh, increasing and so on. And this doesn't only exist at the kind of level of, of uh, the local press or, or, or local people, but also at the higher echelons of government. This is how they speak. Um, Sheikh Hasina herself have considered, uh, you know, in her speeches, she has uh, uh, labeled the Rohingya as, uh, as, uh, as a security risk. Mm. Um, other ministers have pointed to them and said, well, they bring in drugs, they cut down, our, they destroy our environment, they're a burden, and so on. So there is that um, narrative. And Bangladesh is very concerned uh, not to give any idea to its population that this is a long-term problem on its hands, mm. that this is not going to go away. They always try to pretend that you know, repatriation is just, uh, you know, one negotiation away or one other agreement away and so on. And, uh, you know, there's no sense of permanency uh, that Bangladesh is willing to acknowledge or admit to its own people. And this is a huge problem because it means that Rohingya are not allowed to work. They're not able to access any formal uh, education uh, their uh, freedom of movement is constrained. They don't have refugee rights, so it's a huge problem when you when you want to see it and present it as a as just a temporary blip that will be sorted out when it hasn't been sorted out for decades. Definitely, we have a question from one of the audience. Um, is that this narrative is very similar to what we hear from the White House about refugees at our border uh, here in the United States about them being a security threat and we need to put up this wall. And so uh, do you think this is, how is this connected to the rise of nationalism just throughout the world? I would make one uh, important distinction that uh, we are talking about refugees here. We're not talking about migrants. We're talking about refugees who have a well-founded fear of persecution in their homeland, uh, basically genocide. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, when people experience genocide, they vote with their feet, they run. I mean, this is physiological. This is what you'd expect uh, if you have, uh, uh, you know, a, an army, the Tatmado, armed to the teeth, uh, bearing down on your villages, burning them down, raping um, and shooting and, and burning villages then this is what you're going to get. This is a physiological response. And Bangladesh is to be commended that it opened the borders and let people in. So I would make that important distinction that uh, these are not migrants looking for a better life. They didn't come to Bangladesh for to live in camps uh, in the conditions that they do. They fled. And they fled because of a well-founded fear of persecution um, um, and... Uh, which is uh, which is genocide, um, or to live in camps. I think it's very really important to understand that um, really the the pro the way that Bangladesh wants to present the problem is that it's it's a short term thing. Uh, I don't 
think it's the hue of of government because all governments have behaved similarly mm -hmm. as far as the Rohingya are concerned. Um, that this is a temporary situation. We're going to get rid of it. Don't worry. And uh, as a result, they have denied uh, Rohingya uh, rights. They have, uh, well, basically, they have uh, completely constrained uh, their access to basic human rights. And this is uh, this is very important to note that uh, that it isn't just Sheikh Hasina's uh, government. The previous governments have 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 said similar things. And and she, uh, to be fair to her, has taken on that role of the mother of the Rohingyas. And 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 if we look at it from any other country's perspective, we really have to give Bangladesh kudos for being that opening up their borders, being being these very, very generous hosts for the past um, almost for, you know, going on four years now. What do we have to look for in the future? What, how do you think, because as we're, let's talk about Bahasan a little bit. And, you know, we've been seeing these flashy images in Bangladeshi media, influencers talking about this resort island where, uh, you know, uh, Bangladesh, um, the government is, is setting up for, uh, Rohingya refugees. Um, what is reality? Uh, share that with the audience. Well, um, Hannah, with all due respect, um, uh, you're right to say Bangladesh has been generous in opening up its borders and so on. Uh, but I, as I've just explained, I think we that generosity is uh, uh, has certain limits and uh, has quite kind of narrow parameters. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I think those are not very commendable from my perspective. Uh, and Bashan Chor is one example of uh, the kind of work that Bangladesh is doing, which betrays uh, Bangladesh's generous legacy, if you like. Um, it's not a suitable location in any respect whatsoever. Um, it, it's possible that uh, rising sea levels and storms might impact on it very negatively, endangering lives. There have been no, Bangladesh has not permitted any international independent assessment of this island. Um, this island has very little education or you know health service there if, you, if you're critical the, the nearest hospital is four hours away a nearest hospital which could sort you out is about four hours away uh, unless you're tra uh, transported by helicopter and so on um, I mean it's isolating these refugees refugees there will not have um, access to livelihoods or self-sufficiency and so on they're simply expected to just live on handouts. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you have to imagine what, what are we doing here to the dignity of the person? And what do we understand by, by the notion of dignity here? Um, is it just that we need to just keep him fed and uh, keep the refugee fed and sheltered so the refugee doesn't die off, is, is, is that all that it's about? Or is, is life something more than that? Mm -hmm. And um, so um, I think it's uh, uh, this generosity that we speak about that Bangladesh allegedly has is a very limited one. Mm. You know, you said something about this refugee. What is the status of most ref uh, Rohingyas in Bangladesh? Are they quote-unquote, refugees in the legal sense of the word? No, they, they're not recognized as uh, refugees. The UNHCR registered refugees, uh, they may have somewhat more rights. There's about 34,000 of them, but uh, the vast majority are not recognized as refugees. They're recognized as forcibly displaced Myanmar nationals. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't matter. Across the board, they live in the same conditions. They face the same ceilings on education, on employment, on uh, on life. Mm. 
recently uh, there's an actual uh, announcement that had come out uh, late last night early this morning uh, depending on where you were on this uh, uh, in the world could you share um, uh, with our audience what that announcement was and what this means for um, the Rohingya especially in Rakhine state um, Hannah, I've just had time to read the Arakan Declaration. Um, I haven't really talked to anyone about it much. Uh, but what's important here to me is that here are uh, the communities of Arakan, Rakhine State, if you like, mm -hmm. who only three or four years ago, uh, you know, we saw what happened. Uh, the Rakhine are implicated in... Uh, you know, uh, in inflicting all these uh, crimes against humanity, genocide, etc. So finally, we have these these communities coming together and saying uh, we must have peace, and Arakan belongs to all who live in it. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, from an outsider's point of view, and on paper, this looks good. This looks very good. This looks like the next step towards, um, if you like, uh, some sort of sustainable peace. Yes. Uh, and also uh, telling the Tatmado, telling the powers that be, that hang on a minute, you can't divide us. You can't do what you've done for decades and decades and uh, be at our throats, whether we are Rakhine or Rohingya or Kaman and so on. So I think that unity that uh, unity of the of the oppressed uh, is is very uh, welcome but of course that's on paper uh, what actually emerges out of this uh, we have to see the the politics must be really messy uh, and of course truth and reconciliation can't be that easy given the context of rakhine state and what these communities have gone through uh, so there will be probably very uh, deeply entrenched views who will be suspicious of this uh, declaration, who will think, what on earth is this? This is impossible so soon after what we have seen. Um, but let's be optimistic um, and let's see what uh, this first step can do. First step, because you need that. Why is that? Let's talk about about that a little bit more. Why, when we talk about repatriation, um, or we talk about how this will actually play out, what are some of the steps? And I find I feel like this is at least a, some movement, right? To get the uh, where they need to go back needs to be in a in a in a in a place where at least they can trust their neighbors. And I don't know if that trust, how long that trust will take for that trust to be built. But at least as a step, as you said, what other steps need to take place before repatriation is even um, a, something that we can genuinely talk about. Well, I believe uh, tomorrow there's going to be a tripartite meeting between Bangladesh, Myanmar, and China mm -hmm. to discuss uh, repatriation. Um, and of course, missing uh, the Rohingya in this. They're not part of the talks. They're not part of the discussion. They're not part of the consultation, the dialogue. They're nowhere. At least here with the Arakan Declaration, they are part of the dialogue. They are, you know, at the table discussing, you know, what their future, what their shared future might look like. So I think leaving uh, the Rohingya out of the equation seems to be madness. Mm -hmm. And this is what's happened in the past. We mustn't again forget Bangladesh's history in this. Uh, forced repatriation in 1978, forced repatriation in the 1990s. We have UNHCR documents telling us how people were starved in 1978, and then they were forced to go back. I have many interviews telling me, uh, interview, uh, viewees telling me what happened to them in 1992, uh, when they were goaded uh, and they were uh, threatened, they were beaten into going back. So surely that doesn't work. Surely there has to be an understanding that there needs to be a sustainable repatriation. And for that 
to happen, you need dialogue. And for that, you need all the uh, constituencies within Rakhine State to come together and dream about their future and create that vision so that they can make it a reality. Definitely. And this is something in, uh, that even here, the diaspora, uh, they're discussing uh, the Karen diaspora, the Kachin diaspora, um, uh, have talked about this a lot. Uh, what does Burma look like to them? Uh, what What is the meaning of being free in Burma? Uh, should this be a Yugoslavia, a redoing of Yugoslavia? Uh, and uh, so these are, and unless you have these communities on the table and this, these discussions, as you were saying, that there, there really cannot be uh, a sustainable peace, a sustainable, um, you know, this democracy that we have in the United States have pushed on Burma. I mean, we see this right now. Let's talk a little bit about that is um, with the new administration coming in and we see the same um, uh, heads uh, uh, who are going to be leading the United States policy here as well, that under the Obama administration, these were the people who uh, gave Aung San Suu Kyi that green light, you know, uh, our work is done, we have democracy in Burma, and let's take off, you know, up, lift up the sanctions, and um, and now we have the same people back, coming back in power. Those of us working on this over here um, are watching this with trepidation. We, um, What is the sense uh, in Bangladesh, and what have you been hearing on your side? Well, I, I believe that a change in administration in the USA is generally welcome from where I am and where, where Bangladesh is and so on. I think um, there's been a particular person um, who is widely reviled and uh, thought of as an opportunist and so on. But of course, uh, on Burma, they have been on Myanmar. Uh, they've been uh, they've been quite good this administration. Um, uh, if quite good means that you know basically the Tapmadog can't come and buy weapons and so on, but it hasn't really made the kind of shifts that are required. It hasn't really um, uh, engaged in the kind of politics that were necessary if it was really serious about um, changing things uh, in Myanmar. Of course, uh, they're hampered by uh, the other powers that be, Russia and China and the Security Council and so on. I would hope that the new incoming Biden administration uh, will recognize that uh, the history, the, the way that it's moving forward is is for uh, democratic values to be installed everywhere. Um, that's presumably the, you know, the banners which he wants to fly, um, unlike Mr. Trump. So mm -hmm. hopefully he will recognize the limitations of the NLD government and how that's been a fig leaf for the Tatmadaw. Uh, I believe that while we're talking about peace, I think it's, we have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, it will require change in Myanmar, will require external pressure, internal pressure, uh, possibly armed struggle. Um, I, you know, we're not at the stage where uh, Mr. Biden's going to walk in like uh, Mr. Obama did and uh, change things. I think uh, that's, that's a long way away. And it is, uh, it is, and it's going to take a lot of time and continued advocacy, continued effort. But when we speak to people, and you do this on a regular, when you speak to people in the camps, there is definitely uh, this sense of like failing hope, like they want to not l lose touch with that hope because it keeps them alive, but then T share some of your experiences in talking uh, with the, those who've been living uh, living this nightmare for the past four years. Uh, recently, a French journalist asked a question of a Rohingya person, and I translated for the French journalist. And the question was the same as yours, which is that 
do you really think you'll be able to go back uh, to Myanmar and do you want to? And the answer from the Rohingya refugee uh, was absolutely crystal clear, which is all these things that I put up with here, I put up with for one reason, so that I can go back to Myanmar. I haven't come to this country to sit and eat IR, you know, um, ICRC aid or whoever gives them aid. I have only come here to save my life, to save my family's life. The only hope that sustains me is the thought that I'll go back to my native land of Myanmar. I mean, you can't be more direct and clear than that. That That is their, they do not want to remain in Bangladesh. They are not Bangladeshis. They want to go back. They want to have their rights restored. And uh, there's nothing more than they would like them to be involved in all these uh, uh, negotiations that are taking place in order to push things forward. And I think they will not lose their resilience in terms of, you know, no matter what the camps throw at them and no matter what the Tatmadaw throw at them, I think that's, uh, that's really deeply embedded within the refugees that I've spoken to. Mm -hmm. I, I will make a distinction, though. I mean, um, and there is this divide between the newcomers and the old refugees. The old refugees possibly want to stay in, in Bangladesh because they've been there for decades. Mm -hmm. their, their entire lives are there. And there's this kind of enmity between the, the two lots. They're saying, oh, well, they all, you know, the old timers, they, they have become Bangladeshis. Mm -hmm. um, so there is that thing. But um, I think generally speaking, what I've just said about this determination to go back holds. When I sometimes look at this and we look at the work that has been doing at the being done at the UN and 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 it, it just seems even with the court case, sometimes I feel like there needs to be a new mechanism where leadership of the oppressed are able to represent themselves despite somewhere where even if the powers to be don't invite them to the table that they still have a place, whether it's the Palestinians, whether it is um, uh, the Uyghur, the Rohingya, you know, um, Ethiopians in Tigray, wherever these oppression, these massive atrocities are taking place. And I and I don't know if that's uh, it's that's something just Pollyannish thinking on my part, uh, but. Uh, there are, you know, people who have, there are other uh, communities who have declared, um, for example, governments in exile. And uh, when they have been through atrocities like this or where, where they're not, they're fighting for freedom um, and have used that as a mechanism to engage with uh, and speak for themselves. Do you think there's any possibility of that? And especially for the Rohingya? I think that's a very important uh, point that you've made, because if we look at the ICJ, um, and it was incredible. I was there uh, at The Hague. I was there filming, and it was incredible that the, the Rohingya were able to, if you like, drag Aung San Suu Kyi to court. And I think it was a fantastic victory, uh, even that uh, symbolically. And no matter what the uh, court case results in and so on. Um, but how are the Rohingya represented there? Mm. They, are, they have a legal team, a legal team that was uh, uh, brought together by, uh, by the Gambia, uh, inspired by uh, the OIC. Um, so wh where, where do the Rohingya fit in? Mm -hmm. And whilst the Rohingya were there as part of the delegation, um, this may sound harsh, uh, but it's worth noting that it was like a um, little bit of window dressing, that they were just there. They, 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 weren't, they weren't, you know, they weren't, uh, of course, you can say a courtroom is where barristers um, do their dueling, and it isn't a place for uh, uh, victims uh, necessarily. But um, I, I think there's a, we need to question where do, for example, if 
if the if the lawyers are not doing a good job i mean how do rohingya organizations how do rohingya leaders feed into that and say hang on a minute you're not doing a good job um i i really don't see um uh, how this is possible that this is playing out in the world stage and rohingya have such a peripheral role in it sure they are informing the the lawyers they're giving their testimonies to lawyers and so on and the icc too uh there's all the victims uh representative lawyers um in fact the burma task force uh, itself has uh has has uh hired lawyers to present the case of uh of uh rohingya uh, survivors so, but um it, i think is a very valid question that the role that's played in these uh in the uh, in these uh, court situations is not as direct as it could be um and really a better mechanism ought to be found where rohingya are properly represented and their interests are properly uh, uh, uh delivered um so yes yeah i think i i agree with you yeah and um it's these are some of the frustrations and i think this is why it gets it, it, people don't understand that also uh, i i know here in the united states when we're talking to supporters this is something that um it becomes harder for hard for them to understand as well that what is actually uh it even is this really what the rohingya want and obviously there's going to be a variety of plethora of opinions as well definitely we understand that uh, just as you were saying there's some who want to stay in bangladesh some who want to leave and that's their humanity that's that's all of us right we not one american is going to agree or not it's not a monolith where everybody's all you know has the same voice but th- that is where you we uh, we sort of uh, square you know like we want to be there we say oh they're the voiceless rohingya no they're not the voiceless rohingya they have voices they, we are just not listening to those voices and they have to ha- give them that humanity of having diversity in their voices and um but yes this is something that we talk about a lot of um here as well and it's um it would be i don't know where we go from here um i've heard uh you know that especially under the trump administration we saw where the united nations is headed you know how weak it had become now with china and india on the human rights council's places where active genocide you know two genocide alerts in india active genocide of the uyghurs in china and uh, them being on the human rights council at the united nations what you know it seems farcical it's like what are we expecting from these governments um and uh, the na- nation but going back to your work i'd like to spend the rest of the time that we have together um just uh, really highlighting some of the work that you've been doing where uh, where are you hoping to take uh some of the like sort of like your favorite wins what have you you know things that you've accomplished and uh what are you going to be planning to do doing in the future yes i think one of the um outcomes of the lockdown is that <laughs> been able to be quite productive on some aspects of my work going through all my footage and organizing it and uh actually hoping to deliver some uh footage to the um independent international mechanism on Myanmar um but my next documentary will be on uh, trafficking this is a huge problem uh in in the camps and has been a problem ever since particularly a problem since 2012 in Myanmar uh in 2012 persecution in Myanmar increased people found it intolerable uh conditions on the ground in the, in the villages and they started fleeing a man and women and children they started fleeing uh some to Bangladesh but uh, many in the tens of thousands uh to places like um Malaysia and Thailand uh what they would do is hop on a very rickety trafficker boats uh people may have seen uh, images recently of uh, uh what these trafficking boats look like um many thousands have died in the seas traffickers would simply uh abandon them uh if they made it to land they would be um taken to 
these camps in the jungle um, in Thailand. They're there, they would be beaten, more money extracted from their families, and those who were able to pay finally, you know, managed to get to Malaysia. Uh, and organizations such as Fortify Rights and other Human Rights Watch and so on have, uh, have suggested that tens of thousands of people have mm -hmm. died in these horrendous uh, uh, you know, uh, episodes in order to uh, basically escape the persecution in Myanmar. What I did uh, just before lockdown was visit one of these mass graves in, um, in the Thai border. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, for which, by the way, Malaysia still has, it's investigated it, it set up a Royal Commission of Inquiry, but the results still haven't come through. That's something that we must all watch out for, why Malaysia is not deciding to release uh, the, um, the findings of that inquiry. Um, and, I, and I start my story uh, September the 28th, in uh, uh, 2017 in, uh, in Bangladesh, where I witnessed scores of uh, people, uh, their, their dead bodies lying on the roadside uh, because uh, their boats had collapsed, uh, sunk, and uh, so many children, so many women and children had died. And the story starts there, and I trace it uh, into India because I, I followed a group of uh, trafficked women who were uh, who were in a, a government home in India mm -hmm. and, can't and, then, in India. and and then I also go to Malaysia and Thailand and I finally bring back the story in Bangladesh with the recent boat episodes so this is what I'm working on right now mm, that's amazing that's uh, and it's so important to document this like your work it, it, we won't realize this, uh, and I think a lot of people don't realize this until years have passed. And and the the you know we were looking at this in India that, uh, and I have been talking to activists and researchers there that uh, documenting now is so important before before a genocide occurs and then after. Uh, immediately after and because otherwise number one the testimonies they get wiped away people's memories change uh people pass away it, and just to have that uh, for, and put in perspective in their own voices just just um thank you so much for doing it's not easy work to be able you know, working with uh, people who have survivors of a genocide just to that uh, you know it, it, it's hard work on the heart so I really thank you for that. Um, what I wanted to ask you, uh, based on your experiences, what advice would you give um, those of us who are advocating for the Rohingya in, you know, wherever we may be in Canada, in the United States, the other places? Um, for where do you? What would your advice be? What would, should we be focusing on? now uh, what perhaps is, is not working and uh, yeah would just really like to hear that from you i think the first thing is to take heart from all the positive changes that have happened in the last two or three years mm -hmm. um, the icc the icj um, then the court case in argentina all these things put the myanmar regime uh, on the back foot I think these are to be really welcome. I think the next thing uh, to kind of uh, really um, uh, try and do is to engage with Rohingya, whether they're in the diaspora or whether they are in Bangladesh. In this lockdown, what I did is set up a competition, a photographic competition, mm -hmm. uh, for the very reasons you suggested. It's very important to, uh, to document your life. So what better? than to get the Rohingya themselves to document their own lives in this critical period during this pandemic and you, of, uh, all the things that they're going through, passion chore, the internet ban, the barbed wire in the camps, which is uh, which takes a daily toll on these people. Um, so it's very important to uh, engage with Rohingya, whether they are in uh, 
in Bangladesh or whether they're in Europe or America and, and support them. And, um, and, and of course, I understand that it's not so easy to, uh, to suddenly involve yourself. But I think if you, if you, if you follow, uh, if you follow the news, if you follow what's happening, then you should be able to find yourself a niche where you can contribute because things are changing. And even as we said, today's um, Arakan declaration, uh, I think these are all positive things. And I think we should all try and lend a shoulder to make more positive advances this year. Definitely. So anything that is definitely not working that, that people, especially here in the West should stop pushing. Um, well, that's interesting. Uh, what's not working? I mean, I think that list is very lengthy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but as I said, um, I want to, I'm a kind of calf, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a cup half full person. I want to really emphasize those things which are changing for the positive and where we can make a difference, uh, which is to engage the ring and give them opportunities. I think you know, to give the Rohingya opportunities in the camps, or if they're in India, or if they're in Malaysia, or whatever they are, uh, engage them, give them opportunities, um, then you'll see that the results will be, will surprise you. And uh, that's what we can do. Definitely. Well, we'd like to spend a, a few uh, minutes just showing some of, uh, perhaps of some footage from your documentary that has been uh, out. So if we could pull that up uh, as we end this uh, show. Thank you so much for being here with us and for doing the, the work that you do. And um, hopefully many more, uh, we can have more of these conversations in the future as um, things change in the camps. Thank you very much indeed, Hannah, for inviting me. This is the Kumdum border between Bangladesh and Myanmar. You have just seen the dead bodies of a husband and wife killed as they tried to cross no man's land on 2nd September 2017, one week after the start of the Burmese military clearance operations in Rakhine State. They were shot and stabbed to death, meters from safety. Their only child managed to run away and survive. Over the next 48 hours, we encountered other fleeing Rohingya at the border. This is the story of those refugees we met who came from a particular village called Tulatuli. It's important for us to remind ourselves because I think what happens with the news cycle is that we often get sorry, my cat is here. Um, we forget the people that we're working for, the people that we're held accountable to in God's eyes. So as we continue to do this work and all of us, uh, who, those of you who are watching who might have not heard about this, or those of you who have been regular followers and know the, our work, just you know to renew our intentions and to remind ourselves why we're doing this work. Thank you so much, Brother Shafi, for being here. And um, thank you for all of 
uh, our audience for being with us every day. Um, I just wanted to remind uh, and center myself with that because this law, road is long and um, we're going to need each other to make you know, as we walk towards justice, inshallah. So um, thank you so much to all of you again. Assalamu alaikum.